So here I'm back again with my kind of shitty non CC chewed M42 fatigues and my very, very hot mustard shirt that I'm fucking dying getting a heat stroke in. Um, back with a bit of a different video because, yes, I don't only do Vietnam, I like to do World War II. Well, at least I'm getting back into World War II and I kind of want to dip my toes into Korea, but that's uh, that's a different story. Uh, so today I thought we would talk about uh, US Army wool. Uh, sweaters, in this case the high neck by button sweater. Um, I've got this in today, I'm quite happy with it, but um, I feel it may be an interesting thing to talk about because uh, these are kind of important. For example, you want to do paratroopers and you need to put one of these in your musette bag. Well, it's always good to know what you're getting, what you can expect from them, uh, and what you can do or what you could do with a late, uh, like an 80s one, which this is an 80s one, and this is actually. This is not exactly World War II, this is a 50s one, but there's like no real difference aside from the material that it's made out of, uh, the specification of it that I will get back into those details later. Because now I think um, this is probably the part where I'm going to put the unboxing I made for this. So uh, yeah, let's uh, I'll cut to that then. So this is more of the uh, unboxing part of the video, I guess. I just got the package today. It's been a few days in transmit. Got this again from Greece, honestly a very nice seller, so I'll try to get to it, try not to turn it around so I'll show all my, uh, you know, personal details or whatever. Uh, actually, tape, and open this with an M3 while the cat gets into the room. There we go. I only paid about... GBP for it, so 15 pounds. Maybe if it wants to get out, that'd be kind of cool. I think. Gotta say though, very well packaged. And yeah, I did get it for really cheap, and this is extremely well packaged actually. Expecting to be a bit easier to take apart, but in respect to the guy, though, he did package it very good. And here we go. An original five button sweater in about well, not exactly new old stock shape. Got a little hole down here, but uh, I mean, 20 bucks my size. Now, yeah, this thing is normal stock, you can tell from the uh, the tag being so stiff and uh, folded. Yeah, this one is dated, I don't know if it would be visible, but November 21st, 1950, which I mean, it's not super different like, compared to uh, a World War II one. Seems to be just about the same, and it's kind of what I'll be using it for. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll continue with the rest. Well, hopefully it wasn't too uh, shit and way too uh, you know poor quality, because again, it, it is me talking after all. Uh, but yeah, I did get these for, as I said, a very good price. I paid 15 bucks for it. <laughs> In basically new old stock shape, there's a little hole at the bottom that I had to patch up. That is not that big of a deal, I don't really mind. But uh, yeah, seeing for how much these go, I'm quite happy that I got it for that price. And again, this is November of 19, November 20, 21st, 1950, dated. Uh, now I'm just going to get uh, into the history of the sweater real quick. Uh, the high neck sweater was actually introduced in 1942 and it replaced the V-neck and total neck sweater. The V-neck was basically the sweater but without the, uh, the color and the buttons. Uh, simply because it proved to be a more successful design and kind of more adaptable because, for example, you can, you know, fit fold the color backwards for a more comfortable wear. You can open this and regulate it. If, for example, it's not super hot, no, it's not super cold to have it completely closed up. You can open it a bit and regulate your body temperature. If it's too cold, you can wear it closed. The V-neck does not allow you to do that. Um, by the fall of 1942, this was, this was tested as uh, part of the M1943 experimental combat or cold weather outfit. And it actually proved to be an essential part of the kit, uh, part of the, uh, it took, it took up a, a key place in the layering system because, of course, it was based on multiple layers of clothing to prevent, you know, you dying from fucking hypothermia. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, regarding like the changes and evolutions that this sweater had throughout World War II, they're kind of minimal. Um, there was a uh, simplification of the sizing system because before you have actual measurements and now you have you know small, medium, regular, uh, no, small, medium, large, uh, all that stuff. And in early 44, they changed the color, they darkened it to a more OD33 shade, which is again, slightly darker. The original color was more close to this, not exactly this color, but it was lighter than this color. But again, this one being a post-war, it is in that darker shade, which is still fine for World War II. Um, of course, one thing to know is that there were multiple patterns of this um, sweater. What I mean by patterns is that, again, multiple companies manufactured these. Um, so they're not all exactly the same. For example, this is one of the most common versions and the other most common version is more similar to this sweater, having, not having this reinforced part at the top, having the same style of knitted, uh, um, how do you call them, sleeves and cuffs and all the bottom. Um, having, th this one has cat eye buttons, they only have two holes, while the other version, the uh, also common version, will have kind of the same buttons as uh, you would have, for example, a mustard shirt, like what I'm wearing right now, with four holes, um, but you know, the, the buttons will be a bit larger. Um, but yeah, you can see differences in the wool, in the way they were made, there's also a pattern, uh, a, a variation of the, of the sweater, that is made of very fine wool and is kind of continuous. It doesn't have you know changes in the stitching, uh, differences in buttons. You can see also uh, sweaters with officer-like very dark black four-hole buttons. Uh, but yeah, something to keep into account that there's multiple patterns of of well, patterns of or uh, variations in manufacturing of these. But again, it's not no not a big deal. You still can tell them apart from post-war, so that's something you need to keep into account. Um, this one, being a post-World War II one, is made out of uh, shrink-resistant wool. It was something that was tried to be developed during World War II, but they didn't do it by the end of the war. But uh, it, it did come after the war. So if it says, you know, shrink-resistant, it is not a World War II sweater, it is post-war. Not, not something I'm really going to complain about, because, you know, having a shrink-resistant wool sweater is better than having one that isn't uh, especially if you get sweaty in it and you have to wash it so you don't have to worry about it shrinking now the main uh, me meat and potatoes of the video uh it being the comparison between this is a 1990s one and this is a 1950s one right off the bat you can tell that the shade is different this one is of a lighter kind of brown color while this one i don't know if it comes the same way in the camera but this is more of a brown green tone it is fairly dark in real life it comes more out as a yeah a, a mixture between dark green and brown rather than just being kind of light brown on this side regarding the wool itself it is fairly similar although the these ones feel a bit more coarse than these ones these ones are pretty smooth and you can tell the stitching is a bit wider on these ones compared to these now, when you come down to the sleeves, you can also tell that they're quite different. As I said, there's another pattern of a sweater that you need to take into account that is more similar to these. But again, I'm just comparing it, comparing it to this one. Um, so yeah, you can see the wool on, the, on this one is very fine stitched on uh, this, on, on the cuffs, compared to this ribbing. And also has a trim both on the bottom, at the cuffs, and at the neck. Um, now, likely one of the biggest differences is, well, the color, or the, the neck itself. Let's see if I can actually get these a bit closer to each other without making a huge mess that I don't think is actually working out. Yeah. Okay, maybe now. There we go. You can tell this is knit much finer than these, and all of the post-war ones are made like this, well, post post 50s, 60s, 70s. All the 80s one, all the 90s one will be made with this trim, I guess you could say, compared to this very fine wool. So if you see a sweater like this, with this upper compared to this, it is most certainly not a 40s or 50s one. That is for sure. And it is one of the things that you need to take into account because you can buy one of these for relatively cheap. They can run like 10 bucks, really. and 
many people have converted these into World War II sweaters, you know, looking like them, because it's not super hard. If you find the right buttons, you dye this uh, a bit more of a green color. You're gonna have one of these for relatively cheap, and you don't have to use an original for reenacting, for example, even though most of the time the sweater is just kept in a musette bag. Um, so I can see why someone may want to buy one of these. And again, my main intention when I bought this one months ago was to actually convert it into World War II one, and I found this one for cheap, and I, I just went out and bought it. But yeah, don't get burned. If you see this upper with different buttons, someone has tried to modify it into a World War II sweater. So don't, buy, don't pay premium for those. Uh, of course, again, differences, buttons. These are more of the you know, jungle fatigue, big uh, four, four hole buttons compared to in this cat, in this case, cat eye buttons or you know, a smaller green four eye, not four hole buttons. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much more to talk about regarding these. Just keep into account the differences in the neck. And uh, I, I still think these have a bit of potential, you know, like if you've bought one and you modified it to use for World War II, that's fine, honestly, that's what I was planning on doing. Um, and I still feel it's a good alternative if you want to put the work into it, even though it's not much work, because it's literally just dyeing the thing and changing the buttons. Um, if you want to make it, you know, look relatively close compared to one original, because also one of the things that I forgot to mention is on this pattern, you have kind of like a reinforcement on the shoulders compared to, um, you know, the later one does not have it. But again, the other common pattern that you can find in World War II sweater does not have this. So again, it, just a, a bit of a mess, but yeah. I still feel, as I said, it's a good alternative. If you don't have the money, if you don't want to use an original, which is completely fair, because I mean, wool sweaters can snag on anything and they kind of, you know, like break off and uh, start getting a little funky. So just keep into account the differences that you can find, the fact that this area will always be different unless you want to replace it, which seems like a huge deal, honestly. Uh, I wouldn't do it <laughs> myself, at least, because I'm not, you know, talented enough to do it. But uh, again, if you don't want to use an original, this is a decent alternative. You put, if you put the work in, you dye it, you change the buttons. Uh, but again, it's something that's going to stay most of the time in the Buzet bag, so I wouldn't think about it too much. But yeah, don't get burned. It can somewhat be converted into a World War II looking sweater, but just keep into account the differences. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, it could, be, it could have been a fun project, but I just got lucky and I had to buy this one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not, not a super destructive video, but I plan on this being relatively short instead of making, you know, a fucking hour and a half video, which would be a bit, you know, too much. Hopefully the camera is not having a spaz this time. That would be kind of good. And uh, yeah, I mean, hope you enjoyed. If you want any more details regarding these, uh, just ask in the comments. Um, I think I found most of the reference, references for these in USWorldWatcherUniforms.com, something along those lines. I'll put the reference, uh, the link to the site down below because it's, it's full of stuff and they talk more in depth about the different patterns of, uh, well, not patterns, the types, because this is a type one, there's the type two, which is the V-neck and there's the type three, which is the, uh, basically a sweater, a v-neck without sleeves. They go into more detail about those in that site, something that I'm not gonna touch because it's not exactly, you know, relevant to the, to the video. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's all for today and I hope you enjoyed and it wasn't too boring to sit through and it wasn't too uh, unstructured, likely it was, but you know, it's just a more of a casual, quick video that I wanted to pull out. But yeah, that's it, hope you enjoyed and uh, stay epic.